right. Uh, Psalm 69 uh, is <clears throat> in a category of psalms that are often called imprecatory. Now that's not a word we use a lot. In fact, I don't know that I've ever heard it used outside of the context of these psalms. But a psalm of imprecation is a, a prayer for someone's destruction. It's asking God to punish and to wreak vengeance on someone who has hurt or wronged us. Now, this immediately causes some struggle in Christian minds and in people who like to judge Christians. And that is, of course, we go, well, just a minute. Jesus said, love your enemies. Do good to those who hurt you. So how do we reconcile this command of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew and the Sermon on the Plain in Luke, both places and at both times, Jesus instructed us to forgive and to love those, love our enemies. So here we have a, a psalm of imprecation. And there are about eight verses in this psalm that get really rough. David just pleads for God to hurt these people. How do we reconcile that? How do we deal with that? What do we say? Do we, do we say, well, there's really nothing there for the Christians. Sort of the easiest position that you'll, you'll hear some people revert to is they'll say, well, that's the old covenant. Under the new covenant, uh, we, we don't think this way anymore. Well, you might, you might think that way if you don't read the book of Revelation. If you read the book of Revelation, you see Jesus comes back and he does exactly what David is praying for in Psalm 69. So Jesus himself tells us to love our enemies, but in his return, he's going to deal with his enemies. So how do, we, how do we process all this? How do we reconcile it so that we have a, a complete understanding of both of forgiveness and love and caring for our enemies and following the Sermon on the Mount, but also understanding that this, this psalm is not something that merely belongs to the past, but there's something here for us. In fact, I'm going to prove to you that this psalm, that we cannot say of this psalm, it doesn't belong to the new covenant. I, I, if you're honest, I'm, I'm just going to prove to you, you can't say that. All right? So let's read the psalm. See if there are parts of it that ring a bell to you. All right? The, what parts sound familiar? And then we'll, we'll talk about it. So let's read. I like to always read them uh, in their entirety, and then we'll talk about them in its parts. To the choir master, according to Lily's. Of David. Save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. I sink in deep mire where there is no foothold. I have come into deep waters, and the flood sweeps over me. I'm weary with my crying out. My throat is parched. My eyes grow dim with waiting for my God. More in number than the hairs of my head are those who hate me without cause. Mighty are those who would destroy me, those who attack me with lies. What I did not steal, must I now restore? O oh God, you know my folly. The wrongs I have done are not hidden from you. Let not those who hope in you be put to shame through me. O Lord God of hosts, let not those who seek you be brought to dishonor through me, O God of Israel. For it is for your sake that I have borne reproach. The dishonor has covered my face. I've become a stranger to my brothers, an alien to my mother's sons. <clears throat> for zeal for your house has consumed me, and the reproaches of those who reproach, me, uh, reproach you have fallen on me. 
When I wept and humbled my soul with fasting, it became my reproach. When I made sackcloth my clothing, I became a byword to them. I am the talk of those who sit in the gate and the drunkards make songs about me. But as for me, my prayer is to you, O God, at an, and at an acceptable time, O God, in the abundance of your steadfast love, answer me in your saving faithfulness. Deliver me from sinking in the mire. Let me be delivered from my enemies and from the deep waters. Let not the flood sweep over me or the deep swallow me up or the pit close its mouth over me. Answer me, O Lord, for your steadfast love is good. According to your abundant mercy, turn to me. Hide not your face from your servant, for I am in distress. Make haste to answer me. Draw near to my soul, redeem me, ransom me because of my enemies. You know my reproach and my shame and my dishonor. My foes are all known to you. Reproaches have broken my heart so that I am in despair. I looked for pity, but there was none, and for comforters, but I found none. They gave me poison for food, and for my thirst, they gave me sour wine to drink. Let their own table before them become a snare, and when they are at peace, let it become a trap. Let their eyes be darkened so that they cannot see and make their loins tremble continually. Pour out your indignation upon them and let your burning anger overtake them. May their camp be a desolation. Let no one dwell in their tents, for they persecute him whom you have struck down, and they recount the pain of those you have wounded. Add to them punishment upon punishment. May they have no acquittal from you. Let them be blotted out of the book of the living. Let them not be enrolled among the righteous. But I am afflicted and in pain. Let your salvation, O God, set me on high. I will praise the name of God with a song. I will magnify him with thanksgiving. This will please the Lord more than an ox or a bull with horns and hooves. When the humble see it, they will be glad. You who seek God, let your hearts revive. For the Lord hears the needy and does not despise his own people who are prisoners. Let heaven and earth praise him, the seas and everything that moves in them. For God will save Zion and build up the cities of Judah, and people shall dwell there and possess it. The offspring of his servants shall inherit it, and those who love his name shall dwell in it. Well, uh, I trust that some of that sounded a little familiar to you. Uh, let me just ask you, if you're watching a movie and that there's, there's some bad guy, somebody that just keeps doing evil and the whole movie is about the way this, some person is doing evil and getting away with it and, and finally toward the end of the movie, that justice is done. That person who's been hurting other people like sort of gets it. That's a satisfying moment, isn't it? I mean, there are literally hundreds, thousands of movies like that where you, the whole movie makes you think that, you know, this guy's going to get it. He's going to get it. And then in the end, when he gets it, you go, ah, that's, that's satisfying. Uh, I watched recently on uh, Netflix, or I think it was, uh, a series on the Mossad, the Israeli, basically like their CIA. And they interviewed these, those guys. In fact, uh, I saw one of the guys they interviewed. He reminded me a lot of my father-in-law, actually. He, uh, his, his obituary was in the New York Times yesterday. He just died. Uh, uh, Eitan uh, was his name. And, and they talked to him about he went uh, into Argentina and there was a, a 
one of the main Nazi leaders that was in Argentina and, and they found him and he basically grabbed him on the street, threw him into a car. Uh, he and a couple of other Mossad agents and they, they knew certain body marks that he had on him, the scars, they opened up his shirt. They even asked him what his, his SS number was and he told them by memory and he, Eitan said he knew they had the right guy. And when he told that, there was just a sense of satisfaction. Here's a, a Nazi war criminal who's, he, he was responsible literally for the death of millions. And they got him and they brought him back to Israel and they tried him. He remains the only person Israel has ever used the death penalty on. And they hanged him after his trial as a war criminal and a criminal against humanity. Well, you, you hear that and there's just something satisfying about justice being done. Someone that did such heinous crime. And, and, and so psalms of imprecation, imprecatory psalms, are a prayer for justice. And that should not be problematic for Christians. Christians should love justice. We should want justice. Even though Jesus says to us on a personal level, love your enemies, do good to those who curse you. But that's God's instruction to me for the way I should treat my enemies. What you have in view here really, these are the enemies of God. And you have to understand that it is never wrong to want God to do justice to his enemies. This is a different thing. Maybe somebody who took advantage of you, someone who who lied on you, something like that. You know, they make themselves your enemy. Jesus says you're to love them. But those that oppose God, those that uh, are guilty of crimes in essence against God, those that set themselves up as separate from God's law, they're not my enemies, they're God's enemies and it's never wrong for God's, to pray for God's enemies to receive justice. Now. Don't forget, we in a Christian worldview can certainly see justice done on Jesus. We can pray for their salvation, that they genuinely change and that, that justice is poured out on Christ on their behalf, but justice is still done. We pray for justice. So Psalm 69, of all the imprecatory Psalms, it's, it's the most extended. Uh, and I told you, I'm going to prove to you that you can't simply say, well, this belongs to the old covenant and it has nothing to do with the new covenant. And here's my proof is that the New Testament writers weren't at all embarrassed by Psalm 69 and they quoted it extensively. So, you know, I've told you that we, <clears throat> we don't have warrant to just go ripping stuff out of the Old Testament and going, oh, there, that's talking about Jesus when the New Testament doesn't tell us. And there are lots of things like that. You know, uh, I've heard sometimes people try and tell you what everything in the tabernacle means. Like, you know, the, the, the four colors of the veil mean this. Uh, they stand for the four gospels. Well, the Bible never says that. We don't know that. Sometimes people say what the tent pegs stand for. I'm pretty sure the tent pegs were there to hold up the tent. Uh, not everything has to have some shade of meaning. We got to be careful that we don't, we're not just assigning meaning to things that the New Testament doesn't say have that meaning. But when it comes to Psalm 69, we, there's no guesswork. The New Testament writers, the apostles themselves, they picked this Psalm up and they used it and they looked at it in a couple of different ways. Now, let's just take it, first of all, at face value. Let's take it First of all, at, in its historical context, this is a Psalm of David. Uh, when it says, according to lilies, that, that's probably the name of some tune that it was sung to. But uh, this became a part of the Jewish uh, liturgy. It, it's still sung in synagogues on a couple of occasions. There are different lines from this Psalm that are sung. Uh, on the Sabbath or on uh, Rosh Hashanah, the New Year. So it's used still in Jewish liturgy and it's certainly used by Christians. Uh, and it's 
It's just simply David feeling overwhelmed by his enemies. And he's crying out to God. Notice he pictures it in three ways. A deep in verse 2. Well, it begins in verse 1 with, the waters have come up to my neck. And that's, that's a terrifying feeling. If, uh, you know, we, we've seen these floods in the Midwest recently. If you've watched any video footage of that, someone's car, they, they do what they, what they always tell you, don't ever do, don't ever do. Don't drive out there if you can't see the road and the water's covering it. Don't, don't go, don't go. But every time, what do people do? They go. And they get out in there and suddenly they realize, I'm, man, this is overwhelming. And then they try and crawl out. Well, now they're up on top of that car or whatever. They're, and here comes the water. The water's coming up. This is a terrifying feeling. No, no place to go. The flood raging. And this is exactly the way David feels. He's in this flood of troubles. I sink in deep mire where there is no foothold. I've come into deep waters and the flood sweeps over me. I'm weary with my crying out. My my throat is parched. He's like, man, everything is going wrong. And now uh, here's, I want you to see that even when the New Testament looks back at a passage of scripture in the Old Testament and says, well, there's a type of Christ uh, it's never a perfect type. Why? Because anybody in the Old Testament has one thing that they do not have in common with Jesus, and that's what? Sin. All right, so David is a type of Christ, but he's not a perfect type because he's a sinner and Jesus is not. So anytime we look back at David, we've got to say David is the great king. Jesus is the great king who doesn't sin. David uh, is, uh, you know, he, he's the deliverer of Israel. Yeah, but Jesus is the deliverer of Israel who doesn't sin. So when you see verse 5, some people go, oh, well, then David, this can't be about Jesus because in verse 5 he says, oh, God, you know my folly. The wrongs I have done are not hidden from you. Well, <clears throat> that shouldn't put us off. Because that's just a reminder to us that the the type is never as great as the antitype. All right? So the antitype is Jesus. And the type, sort of the shadow on the wall, if you will, is the shadow is never as great as the thing casting the shadow. It's by definition. It's sort of nebulous. It's intangible. So here's David. He's the, he's the shadow on the wall, but Jesus is the, the antitype that cast that shadow. So David admits, he says, now look, I'm not saying I'm perfect. I, I, you, God, you know my folly. But what he's saying is that what's happening to him is not the result of his sin, It's the result of the wickedness of those that oppose him. So if, let's just imagine, we don't know this, but let's imagine David writes this when Saul is after him. That David writes this before he's the king and Saul's the king. And Saul's got his whole army coming after David. Well, David, this would be David saying, now look, I'm, I'm not saying I'm perfect. Lord, you know my sin, you know my folly, but I didn't do anything to make Saul come after me with an army. I've been loyal to Saul. I've been good to Saul. And yet here he has become my enemy when I've done nothing to him. So verse five does not, dis, does not annul this as a type of Christ. It simply says that part isn't a type of Christ. That verse is not. And we'll see that from the New Testament writers here in just a moment. Even though he's, he's a sinner, he says it in verse 5. Look at verses 7 through 9. He says, but even so, it's for your sake that I've borne reproach, that dishonor has covered my face. It's for your sake I've become a stranger to my brothers, an alien to my mother's son. 
for zeal for your house has consumed me and the reproaches of those who reproach you have fallen on me. David is able to see here that really all this is happening to him because uh, they're opposed to God. So their primary sin is not what they're doing to David, but that they reproach God. And because they reproach God, it falls on him. And when God gets reproached, then the psalmist, David, gets reproached. And so he pleads for rescue. He says in verse 13, uh, as for me, my prayer is to you, O Lord, at an acceptable time, O God, in the abundance of your steadfast love, answer me in your saving faithfulness. Deliver me. Now notice here the same triplet in verse two. From sinking in the mire, let me be delivered from my enemies and from the deep waters. Let not the flood sweep over me or the deep swallow me up. Uh, you see that's the same order of the things in verse two. Uh, or the pit close its mouth over me. Answer me, O Lord, for your steadfast love is good. According to your abundant mercy, turn to me. So he begins to plead with God. But he doesn't merely plead with God for his deliverance. He also pleads with God for God to destroy his enemies. In verses 22 through 28, man, he just this is where he calls basically fire down from heaven. Let their own table before them become a snare. <clears throat> now think about that. Uh, can you imagine somebody sitting down to a feast? Uh, I mean, where are you more secure than in your own home and at your own table? And yet David says, now let, let the thing they think of as their most secure thing become a trap. Let them get caught up in their own safety. Let their own table before them become a snare. And when they are at peace, let it become a trap. Let their eyes be darkened so they cannot see. What, what does God sort of do throughout the scriptures every now and then? He, you strike somebody with blindness. Remember when the army comes after Elisha, uh, the Syrian army, and he prays for God to strike them with blindness. They can't see. He leads them right to the king. There's nothing more terrifying than suddenly being in the darkness, losing your sight. He said, let their eyes be darkened so they cannot see. Make their loins tremble continually. Man, that's a, a picture. You know, when, what's the sign of the strength of a man? Uh, his loins. You gird about your loins. Your children spring from your loins. It's that most... Uh, manly part, if you will. This is what he's talking about. But he's saying, let their loins tremble continually. Let what they think of as their strength become their weakness. Pour out your indignation on them. Let your burning anger overtake them. May their camp be a desolation. Let no one dwell in their tents. Uh, and so he just, he, he completely curses them. He entirely imprecates them. And says, Lord, destroy them. He, now think about it. He's not praying for their salvation. He's praying for their damnation. So here's David, who is not a perfect man. He's a sinner. But still, he's a, he's a sadik. He's a righteous man who loves the glory of God. He, he wants God's enemies to be destroyed. So he turns to God for ransom and rescue redemption. He stands up for the cause of the humble. That's what you see in verses 32 and 33. When the humble see it, they will be glad. The Lord hears the needy. So David stands up for the humble and the needy. His suffering is undeserved through the persecution of his enemies. So he laments. He asks God for rescue, but he also Ask God to condemn. Why? Because it's not wrong to want to see God do justice to his enemies. Now, is there a tension here? Certainly there is. Because uh, here's the problem is that we all know we're sinners too. 
we all know that we would be, God would be just if he poured out his wrath on us. It's only of his mercy that he has saved us. And we just have to say, yes, it's of God's mercy that he has redeemed us. But even so, there is a sense in which we know that one day we're going to rejoice in the just punishment of God's enemies. Now, now, yes, we pray for their salvation. We do stand on this side of the cross and we understand the mercy and the forgiveness of God in, in a way that David did not because we're on this side of the new covenant. And yet still, even so, in the book of Revelation, we see that God is going to pour out his wrath on his enemies. But while we're in this, this time, before the coming of Jesus, our greatest hope would be the salvation of God's enemies. But if they will not repent, if they will not turn to him, then what's our desire? Well, it's our desire is not that God would allow his enemies to somehow thumb their nose at him and go their own merry way. Our desire would be that if they will not repent, if they will not turn to him, that then God would do justice. And this is exactly what we see in the book of Revelation. And we see the New Testament writers use uh, Psalm 69 several times. And when they quote it, they quote it in two, diff in two different ways. They quote it on two different levels. The first way they quote it is that they, they speak of it as the words of David. And this is where what Paul does with it in Romans 11. So keep your finger here. We'll be turning back to it. But we're going to look at several New Testament passages where this is quoted. Let's just see how the apostles used Psalm 69. Now, Romans 9, 10, and 11 is Paul's explanation of, uh, he, he has to answer a question when he, he argues in chapters uh, 5, 6, 7, and 8 about God's salvation to all who believe. And specifically, he talks about the Gentiles being included, how God has grafted the Gentiles into the olive tree like a wild olive branch. And he's allowed them to become part of the people of God. Uh, he, then he has to ask a question. Well, he has to answer a question. Well, then has the word of God failed? Because if God gave this revelation to the Jewish people, Abraham, Moses, uh, and you can trace that through the Old Testament, and yet that Jewish Messiah came and the Jewish people rejected him largely. Well, what about that? Didn't the word of God fail? I mean, how did that succeed? It looks like the word of God failed with the Jews. And so then God sort of came up with plan B. And Paul has to answer that question. Has the word of God failed, particularly with regard to the Jews? And so he, he makes this argument in 9, 10, and 11 he says, no, word of God has not failed. For one, and he answers it on two levels. On the one level, he says, God has preserved himself a remnant always. So he says, there's a remnant of Jews that have received Jesus as the Messiah. And uh, you see this, and he says that there's always been a remnant. And there's a remnant now. He also talks about how if God was gracious through Israel's rejection of, of the Messiah and he included the Gentiles. How much more gracious will God be if they turn to him? And so he makes the argument that we should continue taking the gospel to the Jews. When he gets to chapter 11 though, he makes it clear that nobody's saved simply by virtue of being a Jew. You're not saved because you're a descendant of Abraham and he quotes Psalm 69, verses 22 and 23, part of the Psalm of the part of the imprecatory verses, where David is praying for God to destroy his enemies. 
And Paul quotes this from David and he applies it to unbelieving Jews. Now that's harsh language. But here's what I want you to see. There's no escaping what Paul's saying. And every now and then I hear some well-intended Christians, the way they talk is like somehow unbelieving Jews get a special dispensation of grace and they can go to heaven apart from faith in Christ. I want you to see that was definitely not Paul's point of view at all. Look what he says in verses 9. Uh, well, let's look at verse 7. Romans, uh, Romans 11 verse 7. What then? Israel failed to obtain what it was seeking. The elect obtained it, but the rest were hardened as it is written. God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that would not see and ears that would not hear down to this very day. And David says, and so here he is quoting Psalm 69 and he quotes it in the mouth of David. David says, let their table become a snare and a trap, a stumbling block and a retribution for them. Let their eyes be darkened so that they cannot see and bend their backs forever. All right, now, of whom does David say that? He says that of his enemies whom he, he says are also God's enemies. They reproach him because they reproach God. Now remember, I told you it's very possible that he's talking about Saul and Saul's armies who are coming after him. Now, are they Jews or Gentiles? They're Jews. And so David's saying that about his fellow Jews, if indeed he's saying it about Saul and his armies, we don't know that for sure. But what we know for absolute certain is Paul's using it of unbelieving Jews. Paul takes this imprecation of David and he he says, well, it's just like David says. And so he's arguing that those, whoever, you, whoever they may be that don't turn to Christ in faith are the enemies of God. And he's talking specifically about the Jews. Let their table become a snare. Well, man, you can just, you can certainly understand that. The, the table, uh, you think of all the, the shadows, the pictures, the types that Jews have of Christ. And Paul's saying, man, if they won't see Christ there, let their table become a snare, a stumbling block, a retribution for them. Let their eyes be darkened so that they cannot see and bend their backs forever. So Paul clearly quotes that. And, and you look down in verse 25 lest you be wise in your own sight. I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery, brothers. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. So Paul argues that this was always God's plan that in order to include the Gentiles, God has hardened the hearts of this people, they are under God's judgment so that he says the deliverer as, and in this way all Israel will be saved as it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob and this will be my covenant with them when I take away their sins. So Paul argues that there's always a remnant. I, I think he's saying that some in, in every generation, there are some Jews who receive Christ as Messiah. It may be that he's also talking about a, a massive turning to Christ when Jesus returns that, that the Jews who are alive at that time will turn to him. That may be, but he's clearly saying that God has a purpose uh, at this time in the hardening of Israel so that the Gentiles are included. And that's the way he uses the words of David. Now also, we see this Psalm 69 quoted as the words of Jesus. So when they, the, the disciples see Jesus do something or hear Jesus say something, some of them, they go, oh, well, that's like Psalm 69. Turn to uh, John chapter 2. Now, 
Jesus cleanses the temple two different times in his ministry, once at the beginning of his ministry, once at the end. We're studying Luke. Luke only talks about the second time. John tells us about the first time. But in John 2, verse 13, this is, boy, you talk about a change in scenery. We go from the wedding at Cana where Jesus is making wine for everybody and suddenly he's at the temple and, and he gets mad at the money changers and drives them all out. And uh, verses uh, 13 through 17 uh, you know, he, he drives them out. He pour, he turns over their tables, he throws their stuff around. And verse 16, he told those who sold the pigeon, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of, of trade. And his disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. So when Jesus does this, the disciples go, ah, that's the 69th Psalm. That's just like David said, but they see Jesus in those words. Turn over to John 15. Here we see Jesus being hated by the world. Jesus is talking about the world hating him. And if the world hated uh, him, they're going to hate you. He says uh, in verse 20. I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. But all these things they will do to you on account of my name because they do not know him who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have been guilty of sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me hates my father also if I had not done among them the works that no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have seen and hated both me and my father. But the word that is written in the law must be fulfilled. They hated me without a cause. Well, there we go. That's right from Psalm 69. Uh, and Jesus is saying that Psalm that David wrote about the enemies of God reproaching him is true of now these Jewish leaders that are rejecting him. They've become the enemies of God because they've re rejected him. He's hated by his own. Turn over a page or two to John 19. Here Jesus is on the cross and uh, down in verse 28 after this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said, to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there. So they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished and bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Now what did, what did the, the psalmist write back in Psalm 69? He said, uh, verse 21, they gave me poison for food. For my thirst, they gave me sour wine to drink. Jesus on the cross, there's something yet that's not been fulfilled. So he says, I thirst. They give him sour wine. He says, it's finished. You see how John pictures that? Jesus has come to fulfill everything prophesied about him. He hadn't yet fulfilled that. It's the last thing he does in John's, in John's gospel. It is finished. After he takes the sour wine, he says, I thirst. They give him that. It's finished. He dies. Jesus, what's John showing us? Jesus came to fulfill everything that was written of him in the law, the prophets, and the writings. So here Jesus says that on the cross. And so Jesus is saying he fulfills Psalm 69. Jesus is showing us that David is the type, he's the antitype. He's the, the one that was casting the shadow back on the wall, back on David from the light of the kingdom back in history and Jesus shadow cast 
long back in history across all of the Old Testament scripture. And Jesus shows us that in Psalm 69. Uh, and now, Paul does this with it too. Uh, Paul, turn over to Romans 15. Remember, we looked at Romans 11, how Paul used it in the words in the mouth of David. But now look at Romans 15, verse 3. Here, Paul is saying in Romans 15 about how we who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up. Now look at verse 3. For Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. Now look how Paul uses it here. You might, uh, this is really fascinating to me because you might say, that, well, then we can look at these Psalms of imprecation and say, well, look at that. If uh, I, that means that I should pray for my enemies to be destroyed and I should pray for God to just bring his vengeance down on, on uh, my enemies. But remember, it's not about my enemies, it's about the enemies of God. And Paul uses it to tell us not how to pray imprecation on our enemies, but instead how to bear their reproach. He says in the same way that Jesus bore their repro the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. He's quoting Psalm 69. And he's saying Christ didn't please himself, just like it's written in Psalm 69. The reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. The people that reproached God reproached Christ in the same way the people that reproached Christ are going to reproach you. So Paul says, basically, then you should show them kindness. Jesus didn't try and please himself. You shouldn't try and please yourself either. So he quotes it there. Now, Paul takes the Psalms as a motive to bear reproach, not to pray for judgment. Isn't that fascinating? So, we who are believers, do we pray for the punishment of our enemies? No, we pray for the punishment and destruction of God's enemies. But the good news is that Jesus went to Calvary's cross to bear that wrath and to bear that judgment. And everything you read in the book of Revelation that God is going to do to his enemies, God did that much to Christ on the cross. Jesus, because he's the infinite God man, could suffer as much on the cross. He could take all of the suffering of all of God's enemies and all of God's wrath. He could take it on him in place of his people. And he could bear that wrath. So God, the one who executes wrath on his enemies, is also the God who suffered that wrath to make his enemies his children. This is the scandal of the gospel, that there are none who deserve this goodness of God. There are none who deserve God's mercy. So when we pray for the destruction of God's enemies, we do so with humility even in that. Like David, we got to say, now, Lord, you know my folly. You know I'm a sinner. But, Lord, I want your glory above all else. And if you are glorified through salvation, then, Lord, save. And if you are glorified through judgment, then, Lord, judge. You're the one who knows what is right, what is good, what is best. And I'm asking you to execute your perfect justice so that you're glorified. That's my prayer. And that's the prayer of David in Psalm 69. And that's the way the apostles took it and saw it. This is for New Testament believers. But we do it. We do understand the light of the gospel. It is different for us than it was for an Old Testament believer because we see God's wrath poured out on Jesus. And we know that God deals in grace and God deals in judgment. And 
we trust him to know which is best and when it's best. So that's our prayer.